Halo Combat Evolved released on the original Xbox in 2001, and with it, a brand new sci-fi universe emerged. The year is 2552, and humanity is at its last stand with a ruthless alien faction known as the Covenant. A massive superstructure, a halo, designed by the enigmatic forerunners, may be the key to ending the war, but it's also home to an invasive parasitic life form called the Flood that threatens all life in the galaxy. It's also a game that wore its inspirations on its sleeve. James Cameron's Aliens, John Carpenter's The Thing, Larry Niven's Ringworld novels. Halo CE pulled from a lot of different sci-fi stories to tell its own. It was Halo 2 where I think the series really found its footing, introducing countless new additions and further fleshing out the unique aspects of its predecessor. While the game is best known for its incredible impact on multiplayer with its Xbox Live features, I think that reputation overshadows the fact that Halo 2 expanded the universe in a way that most franchises can only dream of. Halo 2 will be 20 years old this year, so I thought it was the perfect time to revisit the game, to discuss its incredible world building, and all the clever ways that Bungie Studios conveyed it to players. By allowing players to play missions as the Arbiter, Halo 2 opened up its signature enemy faction for an in-depth exploration. Seeing the Covenant from the inside gives us an understanding of how their theocratic regime operates. We get to see just how much religion is involved in every facet of their life. Within the Covenant, faith is used as a means of control and a cudgel to squash dissent. It becomes clear from the very first cinematic that the prophets are the ruling class of the Covenant hierarchy. You can tell their role just from their character designs alone. They wear ceremonial robes and large gold crowns with a halo hologram in the center. They're old, weak, and frail, floating on hover chairs instead of walking around. It's clear they're not fighters, though they do have surprisingly durable skulls. By sticking around Regret's holograms on Delta Halo, the players can hear speeches that tell you some of the history of the Covenant and their formation. Long ago, the Prophets and Elites fought an equally fruitless war. Indeed, I suspect we would still be at each other's throats had the Prophets not found evidence of the Forerunners and their great journey. It's a great detail that a lot of players likely missed. Another interesting aspect of Covenant society that has a strong focus is the rivalry between the Elites and the Brutes. Through every interaction, we can feel the uneasy tensions that exist as a result of their places in the Covenant hierarchy. In fact, the designers emphasize this by making it so Elites and Brutes never fight side by side in gameplay. Brutes only appear as enemies to the Elites following the Great Schism, never allies. The brute character designs convey so much about their nature. Unlike the agile, armored elites, the brutes are bulky, far more animalistic, and barely armored. This contrast is also reflected in their weaponry. The brute plasma rifle is burning red, as opposed to the plasma rifles that the elites wield. The brute shot is a volatile weapon, with a sharp blade protruding from it a design that perfectly showcases the Brutes, well, brutality. Brutes are also the only Covenant members who we see using human weapons during gameplay. They really care more about lethality than strict adherence to any codes of conduct or honor. These hostile tensions don't boil over until the Great Schism late in the game. Before that, the Covenant is facing a different threat from within its own ranks. The first mission we're sent on as the Arbiter is to eliminate the leader of a group of rebel heretics. Ever since I played Halo 2 as a kid, I was enamored by the heretic faction, but it was only when I started writing this video that I actually understood why. They're a throwaway faction, only existing in the game for a mere two levels, but despite their minimal screen time, Bungie managed to make them really stand out, 
The heretics have an interesting backstory that firmly ties them to the setting, as they were dispatched to a Forerunner gas mine above the Halo ring for the first game. Once the Halo was destroyed, they made contact with the Monitor, Guilty Spark, who informed them of Halo's true purpose. Not only does this flesh out more of the Covenant's actions during Halo CE, but it's also a direct result of your actions in that game. This goes a long way in making the universe feel alive and responsive. They also have unique character designs that separate them from regular Covenant forces. Instead of bright colored armor, they wear golden beige armor that covers less of their body. The Elite's harnesses have these interesting protrusions coming out of the back, and the Grunts have these glowing blue tanks we don't normally see. The Elites don't have a helmet, instead only protective eyewear and a respirator in their mouth, making them equipped to handle the environment of a gas giant. Likewise, the Grunts have a unique respirator, and unlike most of the Grunts which use plasma rifles, these heretics are all equipped with needlers, which helps make combat encounters with them feel distinctive. Not only do the Sentinels fight alongside them, but you can also spot the Sentinels repairing the docked Seraph, a neat little detail that highlights their alliance. Halo 2 also introduces us to High Charity, the holy capital city and homeworld of the Covenant, that looks like it was forcibly ripped straight out of a planet and built out over time. The massive scale of the space station really shows us how large the Covenant is as an empire. It's absolutely enormous, and we only get to see the tip of the iceberg. The striking visuals and architecture inside High Charity make it one of the most interesting places in the entire Halo series. There are rounded purple hallways that connect parts of the city. Gravity lifts used for transportation across different levels and chasms. Decorative glass shards hanging from the ceiling. Outdoor areas that, given the Covenant's focus on faith, likely serve as prayer gardens. Anti-gravity pillars and platforms suspended in the air. The Forerunner keyship in the distance dwarfs all the other buildings in the cityscape. It's illuminated by a bright light from above, showing the incredible reverence they hold for it. It's not difficult to tell that this thing is highly important to the Covenant. All throughout the city, you can hear the Prophet of Truth make these broadcasts. There are those who said this day would never come. What are they to say now? You can imagine how this would have been used before the Great Schism, most likely for announcements and organized prayers. High Charity isn't the only homeworld we visit, because the Covenant launched their invasion of Earth, forcing Master Chief and the UNSC to fight back in Africa. Old Mombasa is a gritty and worn down place. Unlike the stereotypical cyberpunk city you might expect to see in the year 2552, these city outskirts feel outdated and quaint, not dissimilar to the way that a lot of the UNSC weapons and technology is. It feels real, rugged, and lived in. Old Mombasa ends and new Mombasa begins with this impressively large bridge and the difference is stark. It instantly feels more high-tech. There's bright digital signage and automated mechanisms on the highway. In contrast to old Mombasa, new Mombasa is a more traditionally futuristic city. The buildings are sleek and huge. There are skyscrapers with company logos. However, new Mombasa still isn't a cyberpunk city. In fact, it's almost minimalist Despite it being a metropolis, it has open scenic areas and decorative waterfalls.
The enormous space elevator in the distance serves as a monument for how far human engineering has progressed in 500 years. New Mombasa is what I would consider the weakest part of the game's world building, something Bungie would rectify by revisiting it in Halo 3 ODST, where it feels much more alive and realized. The city streets in Halo 2 are nearly completely empty, though there is a detail I really like. This citizen alert sign that you could spot in various areas of the city gives us a small glimpse at how ordinary people were dealing with the human covenant war. Our time on Earth is cut short when the prophet of regret makes a slip space jump, sending us to our next destination, another Halo. Halo Combat Evolved deliberately kept the ring devoid of living creatures to make the introduction of the Flood more impactful. In contrast, Halo 2 lets us see more of Delta Halo's ecosystem. The ring has birds flying in the distance and fish swimming underwater. It doesn't give us a comprehensive view of the ring's wildlife, but it's enough to convey that the Halo installations aren't lifeless. There's more of the classic Forerunner architecture and megastructures from Halo CE, but bigger in scope and more elaborate in design. Even more prominent than those, however, are these ancient stone temple ruins. In fact, they're one of the most important visuals in Halo 2, spanning not only the campaign, but the multiplayer maps too. They're older than any of the other Forerunner architecture on Delta Halo, and often even housed in visibly newer structures, which implies they were transported to the ring as opposed to being built here. Were the Forerunners preserving relics of their history? Or were they studying their own origins? We never get a solid answer in the game, only speculation. A small but intriguing detail is that the Forerunner hollow panels show a hand that looks remarkably human, but with six fingers, further obfuscating the already nebulous connection between Forerunners and humanity. Did their race have a six-fingered hand? Or is it a depiction of a human hand, mirrored to imply ambidextrous use? Like Installation 4, this ring also has its own monitor. 2401 Penitent Tangent. For some reason, I always liked him as a kid, even though he only appears for a few lines and we don't learn anything concrete about him. I think that's why I liked him. Everything Forerunner in this game is obscured in deep mystery. Penitent Tangent clearly failed in his containment of the Flood. That we can see. But we don't know exactly what went wrong or how. We can tell from the scale and extent of the outbreak that it's not a new development, but for how many years have the Sentinels been waging this war to protect the Ring? Centuries? Millennia? You never fully learn the history of the infestation. There's no terminals, audio logs, or anything the subsequent Halo games would adopt. All we have access to are the visible efforts around us. A massive sentinel wall projects a shield around the ring's library to prevent the spread. But despite that, a grave mind was able to form, which clues us in on just how severe this outbreak is. Oh yeah, th this is the first time we ever see a grave mind. In the first Halo, we see the flood start to accumulate biomass in the control center of the Truth and Reconciliation but we never know what the fruits of their labor would eventually produce. In Halo 2, we learn the end result is a massive compound mind capable of intelligent thought and reason. An almost imperceptible detail is that the grave mind has taken over the ring's control room, where we visit in Combat Evolved, which explains why the control room we go to at the end of this game has a wildly different layout. It's a backup or replacement facility yet another countermeasure to ensure the ring doesn't fall to the flood. While the grave mind being able to teleport Chief and Arbiter might seem like it comes out of left field, it's actually consistent with what's established in the first game. The grave mind is in control of the Halo's monitor, 
who we know from our experiences with Guilty Spark, has the ability to teleport across the ring. At this point in the story, High Charity is in orbit of Delta Halo, meaning it's well within the range of the Monitor's teleportation ability. Before it was unfortunately cut from the game during development, you were originally going to see the Gravemind's tentacles appearing throughout the level before its eventual introduction, which would have served as a cool connection. But the game still does have a lot of neat, blink and you'll miss it connections that link your adventures on the ring. On Sacred Icon, you can actually look down and see the lake from the previous level where Master Chief kills Regret. You can also see the Sentinel Wall in the distance on Delta Halo and Regret, which is where the Arbiter ends up traversing in Sacred Icon. There's a Sentinel factory that crashes down to the surface if you look into the skybox on Sacred Icon. And then, in Quarantine Zone, part of the level you have to navigate through is that crashed factory. It's little flourishes like these that make our adventures on the ring seem connected and cohesive. Halo 2 is well known for its extremely rocky development. The grueling crunch nearly broke Bungie, and the game suffered from extensive cuts. Despite that, what the game's writer Joe Staten and the rest of the team at Bungie were able to accomplish was nothing short of incredible. The world building of Halo 2, regardless of what had to be axed, ended up being what I would consider the best world building out of any game on the original Xbox. Even just looking at the Halo games alone, it had the largest impact on the later entries. So much of the franchise draws from what this game introduced. Halo 2 brought Halo to a whole different level and turned it into the sci-fi juggernaut that it is today. Its reputation may be centered around its multiplayer component, but 20 years later, Halo 2's campaign still gives players a well thought out and engaging universe to sink their teeth into. Please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel. You can also donate on Patreon if you'd like to support me directly. Thanks for watching.